everybody, and welcome to the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where again, you could hate my poetry, or you could hate me, or you could hate both, and that's fine too, because you could choke on a bag of dicks, or you're here because you find me charming. That's also fine. Lots of stuff, lots and lots of stuff to get into today, but I'm going to try to do some house cleaning shit which I should be doing every time I do this, but I don't want to ever have a case of the should-haves, and neither should you, so don't fucking do that shit. So here we go. First off, I want to give a big, big thank you to everyone who showed up last night at the um, Sims Library of Poetry um, workshop, the Poetic Anarchy workshop I did there. Um, It was awesome to be able to talk to a bunch of new poets, um, new to me, I mean, like people I don't know, and be able to kind of see people on all different walks of their writing journey and see that these people who are doing so much more than a lot of my students are doing are dealing with the same fucking problems and dealing with the same shit. That was just really refreshing, and the people there were great, and what I should probably do is plug a couple of their books, so maybe I'll get some of them on here, maybe I'll do that, maybe I'll have, um, if you were at the thing, um, and you want to come on the show, hit me up, I'm going to try to find you guys individually, but unless you've done something heinous, my detective skills are a bit shit, so let's just fucking be real right here. So I'll see what I could do. I'll see what I could do. I'll see what I could do. So the next thing I wanted to talk about, I want to give a big thank you to the people who support me, who support this show, who support my YouTube channel, who are just kicking ass, part of the Anarchy crew, the whole fucking thing. Let me go ahead and do that. Going through uh, the Patreon, the Patreon homies, I want to give big thanks to Michael, Deborah, Cedar, and Harry. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. And then as far as the Anarchy Crew goes, again, you guys are my fucking family, dude. Bunny, Nate, Mindy, Thomas, Tim, Lisa, and Josh. Thank you for joining, my friend. Um, I'm so glad you guys are here and you guys are doing great shit. And Josh, Josh is brand fucking new and Josh sent me a poem and he doesn't know it, but that's going in the next blood rag. I still got to fucking talk to him about it. So thank you guys for that. And then, um, honestly, one of the biggest fucking shout outs I could fucking throw Patrick, you know, I'm coming for you, buddy. Um, Patrick is, um, just a fucking awesome mamma jamma dude yeah i'm so fucking glad you're digging my shit bro and um thank you so much for your fucking support i you're you're the fucking shit my friend thank you so much so the big crew shout outs there that was good times if you are listening to this on itunes or any other kind of podcast platform please don't be a dick just give it five fucking stars and leave a review Your review could say whatever the fuck you want, but just give me the fucking five stars for fuck's sake, dude. Like, just look at it like this. Let's look at it like this. I'm the Young Bucks. You're Dave Meltzer. Anything I do means you give me five stars. And I'll name a finisher after you. So Nate's probably the only one who I just popped there. But um, yeah, so that was fun. Let's do that. If there is a podcasting platform out there, that you really like using that you have not been able to find the I hate Matt wall poetry podcast on let me know because I only know about shit because people tell me about it I do not wander through the interwebs trying to find things so unlike someone who likes to turn over rocks and find out what's underneath I wait for you guys to go look at what's underneath this rock and then I go oh look at that So if you guys don't show me what's under the rock, I will never know the rock's there. I got other shit to do. So thank you guys for that. If you are watching this, that means you're already in the crew um, on my YouTube page in the membership tab. If you are only listening to this, that means you are not in the crew 
and you are watching a audio, if that's even a thing, on YouTube, or you are listening to this on a podcast platform. But if you want to see the beautiful face that this ridiculously sexy, sultry voice is coming out of, then you need to go over to the YouTube and do the join. And on any tier, you get to see the mug that floweth over here. Ooh, that's interesting. I just got a message from someone who I never thought I would get a message from. Things are looking up. You know what else is looking up? I sold some fucking art the other day. So that was fucking cool. I didn't see that coming. Uh, mainly because I haven't really been trying to do it. Like, I've been doing, I've been painting and doing all this shit, but I haven't really been trying to sell my art. Like, I just, I don't understand the market. So I've been kind of hesitant on it, but that's pretty cool. Th things are, things are looking up, guys. Things are looking up. So I think that is enough preamble, and I think we are ready to start the show. And today, we are going to be talking about something. Something, something, something. And I'm even going to fucking do research live on this recorded show. Probably should have put some brandy in that coffee. It's fucking kind of a, a rough one right now. Okay, so one of the things we're going to talk about, I just had to actually do some research there. I was reading. And I'm going to read just a little bit of this, okay? Um, where, where did I find that? gem. Oh shit, where was it? I just fucking had it. Oh, okay, here we go. So the first thing we're going to talk about here is the death of the author. And the death of the author is something that I find that a lot of poets subscribe to. They like this idea. I feel like a lot of fiction writers, a lot of prose writers, do not like this idea very much. And I found that fucking interesting. I found that fucking intriguing. So I was thinking more and more about why poets would appreciate this more. And some of you might be going, well, what the fuck is the death of the author? I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. So I am going to read you the shortest summary I can find here. Um, Roland Barthes, Barthes, 1967 essay, the death of the author argues against the traditional practice of incorporating the intentions and biographical context of an author into textual interpretation because of the limitations opposed on the text. Now, some of you might be saying to yourself, Mr. Mountwall, that sounded lovely, but because you did a stupid voice, I couldn't concentrate on what the fuck you were saying. So let me give you a summary of the summary but just know my summary is always longer okay i'm a fucking size queen over here the idea of the death of the author is that when someone is doing critical analysis or just interpretation of somebody's work that the author should not be a part of the work the um things around the author's life and I, I guess I would go so far as to say, because um, if you're going to do that, I don't think you could throw in um, social or economic um, or political things that happen around that time as well. Um, maybe you can. I don't know, because that's more of a society thing and not an individual thing. But the whole idea here is, is that the work should stand on its own. And I feel like poets like this. A, because um, their work can stand on its own. And then people can start digging into what these metaphors mean and um, what is happening in the poem here. It's also kind of weird, too, because I don't know when the... And I can't even remember what it's called. But there was something where there was a new form of critiquing work. Like critiquing literature and a lot of it had to do with socioeconomic and political 
landscapes around the time of something being written. And I don't really know if either or was a retort to the other, but it would make sense if it was. But anyway, so this whole idea that the poet should be non-existent and the work itself should be the thing focused on, I could see being a big deal in the late 60s because we just came out of the beat generation. And before that, we had all of these other poets going back and then going into the romantics where their lives almost seemed like a bigger deal than their work. Plath in the Oven, I think more people know about than anything Plath wrote, you know? So just little things like that. And so that's interesting that a new batch of poets dating back from the late 60s really felt that this should be a thing. But I feel like it didn't really pick up steam until like the last like 10 fucking years. I'm sure there's people who felt that way, but I've never heard people talk about it as much as I've heard people talk about it just in the last, God, probably like three years. I've heard people throw this term around like a lot. And maybe that's because I don't fucking run in circles like other people do. But if I'm hearing it, that means it's a bigger deal than how I hear it. Because by the time it gets to me, you know, that means it's fucking dead. It's kind of like um, Delaware, the Delaware music scene, you know, like I think up until about like five years ago, Delaware still thought Poison was a new band. So um, if, if you are in Delaware, I apologize for insulting you, but, um, you know, just a little behind the times, you know. So anyway, I just kept thinking about this and kept thinking about this. And um, a lot of people also say that the death of the author is the birth of the reader, because now you're giving the reader all of the responsibility to be able to wrestle with the text and find out what shit is. And so... In me thinking about this, and me being the dick that I am, I found a inconsistency, I guess is the best way you could put it. Because if we are truly going to believe completely and wholeheartedly in the death of the author, does that mean once the poet, since we're focusing on poetry here, and we could have this conversation again if you guys want about literature, but I don't think most literature care about the death of the author as much as poetry does. So, if poets truly believe in the death of the author, once they write something, are they contradicting themselves by doing revisions? Some of you are like, uh, no, you're a fucking idiot, shut the fuck up. Hear me out. If you write something and then you wrote it because you were the writer, you changing anything that you put down originally means that the author is quite involved in what's happening. This means that you do not trust the reader to understand your work properly. So you revise and you revise and you revise and you revise to a point where you believe that the reader of this work will now not only understand it, but love it. Okay? So, you have been, like, toying with the reader based on the fact that you don't think that the reader would be able to handle the work you originally wrote. And when I say not be able to handle... That could mean anything from not understand it, to not appreciate it, to not find the value in it, so on and so on and so on. So you, by revising, are not trusting the reader at all. Um, I would love to have a discussion with any of you about this. Like, if you, if you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth, and you think I'm full of shit... Let's talk about it, because this would be a really interesting piece to fucking go back and over in a bunch of times and shit. 
because I really think that anything anyone would be able to say to that, I think I would be able to talk my way out of that, just like a, a good speeding ticket, you know? Now, real quick, just to make everything abundantly clear, I understand that the argument I'm using for the death of the author is a bit stretched out from what the original version of the death of the author means. But when you really think about it, the more the author gets involved in something, the more the author fucks with something, the more the author's presence is being felt. So how much death of the author should the author provide if the author thinks that his death in this whole fucking thing is the important thing. And I use his in the the royal his. Come on, guys. And I use guys in the royal guys. Come on, everyone. Jesus fucking Christ. What are you trying to do to me here? So you guys see what I'm saying. Like, I'm making an argument here. I'm not a psychopath. I understand things. But I really, really think that poets who believe in the death of the author, who believe in mega revision, who believe that you should trust your reader are being very hypocritical. But but it is interesting because the whole idea because I hear a lot of people say that they get pissed off when it seems like an author or a poet doesn't trust their reader enough. And they fucking have to, like, um, kid glove them to death with their work. And I think there is a bit of truth in that. And I think a lot of this comes back to the video. I, I, did, I put a video up. Um, maybe I'll talk a little bit about it here. Talking about cliches. And how I think cliches now... Actually, should I just go through the whole fucking thing? Okay, here's the thing. I was listening to um, the show Sleeve Rickets, um, which you guys should all check out. It's a good show. And I can't remember what fucking episode it was, but this dude said... And I'm sure this dude's like some famous fucking motherfucker that I'm supposed to know. Whatever. He said, first thought is not best thought because your first thought is always a cliche. And I got all pissed off and I wrote a fucking poem about it and I fucking sent it to Matthew (laughs) over at Slee Ricketts. And I'm like, listen here. Um, It wasn't like that. But it was just like um, my, my thing was... If your first thought is a cliche, then you're an editor and not a poet and not an artist and you should sell insurance was the gist of what I was saying. Um, And then I was thinking about it some more and I was like, dude, this is pretty fucking deep because... I think cliches are very fucking important now that I think about it. And I feel like a lot of the reason why the poetry industry, the poetry machine, is as fucked as it is right now. Hear me out. This is fucking weird. Poetry is more popular now than it's ever been. Poetry is making more money now than it has in years. Years, 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 years. Okay? But the thing that's making the poetry industry money is not the formalists, okay? It's not the, the academics. It is insta-poetry. And these new poets who a lot, of, a lot of people don't even consider poetry, okay? So that's their fucking bitch and that's their fucking argument. But here's the thing. When 
you go to a writing workshop and your workshop fucker says, you know what, you got to lose that line because that's a cliche. Don't don't use cliches. That's bad. No cliches. No cliches. And all this shit happens. You are saying, you are admitting that your audience is limited. Your audience already knows these cliches. So you're saying that you do not ever expect your audience to grow. Your audience are the same people, the same 10 fucking people, okay? Or 20 people or 100 people. Your audience is not going to grow because your audience knows all these cliches. But every cliche has to be heard by someone the first time, okay? Or else they won't even know it's a fucking cliche. So there are millions of people on the planet who never have heard these cliches. And these instapoets, and again, I don't think they're smart enough to know that they are doing this. I think it's fully on accident. They are writing these very little tiny poems that are ancient cliches. But all of these people love them because they've never heard these cliches before. Because for so many years, people have been saying, don't use cliches because that's a cliche. We've heard this before. So there's been this like kind of cliche desert that has been going on for like the last 30 fucking years. Okay. And a lot of these people have never heard these cliches before. So when one of these Insta poets says something like, oh, and it was on the tip of my tongue or something like that, some fucking teenager is like, oh my God, this bitch is a fucking prophet. Oh my God, that's brilliant. And they think it's fucking new and they become a fan and they come into it. So by hating on cliches, you're limiting the growth of your fucking industry. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, if you if you were like, these 10 people are the people who are our audience, and we are a huge publishing empire, we do not want to grow. But here's the thing. The big publishers are signing these Instapoets to fucking deals. The Instapoets books are selling fucking copies, and no one else's poetry is selling. So, if we could take a step out of ourselves and look at what the fuck is going on, would we be able to say, I was wrong? Maybe we should fucking rethink this whole fucking cliche thing. Okay? So, that was that whole bit. And, um, you know, you could take that for however you want. And then the other thing I did a video on this week was making your work mean less. This came up. Was Did someone ask me about this? Either, I don't know. Either someone sent me an email or someone left a comment on another video I did. They were talking about how one of the struggles they have as a writer is they start writing and then they feel like the thing they're writing doesn't have enough importance and that it it doesn't, it doesn't mean enough. It's not big enough. It's not, um, it, it doesn't have the legs to be immortal. You know what I'm saying? So they freak out about it and then walk away from it and don't finish it. And that is an extreme version of this problem that I've heard tons of people have. And I think the answer to this is we as poets need to just calm the fuck down okay i have a poem it's it's one of my favorite poems because it's uber short and it's called poetry and it's probably the only poem of mine that i know by heart okay and it is poetry is bullshit the sooner we realize this oh wait no that's not how it goes look at me fucking say i memorized the poem and i can't fucking remember it uh, poetry is bullshit. Oh, as soon as we realize this, it may mean something. And 
I think this is still very fucking accurate, and I agree with it still. And it's kind of a thing where if we can look at our own work and realize that it doesn't fucking matter and not worry about it and just write whatever the fuck we write, you start becoming loose with your fingers, loose with your pen, and you trust it more, and you can just spill more. And as you do this, and as you have meaningless lines, okay, that just push a narrative along, or push a scene along, or push an emotion along, when you hit that one line that is a fucking just like a nuclear fucking bomb, okay? The light is so fucking bright off of it. It's just a line that fucking knocks you fucking dead. You will be able to realize that that line is fucking amazing because it's around a bunch of ordinary lines, okay? On the video, I did an example about naked ladies, and I think that's going to fall flat on a lot of people. So let me do it like this. If you are at a Taco Bell and a basketball player, an NBA pro player, walks into Taco Bell and there's like 20 people in Taco Bell and this one NBA player, that NBA player is going to look tall as fuck. It's going to be shocking. It is going to stand the fuck out. But if you're the only person in Taco Bell and a bus drops off an entire NBA team, those individual tall fuckers are not going to seem that impressive because now there is a room full of tall fuckers and you. Okay? So when you are writing that poem, and when you tell people that story, oh my God, I saw a whole NBA team today. That's cool. But if you were the person telling the other story, you were like, oh my God, dude, I was at Taco Bell today. And this fucking tall ass motherfucker walks in, almost fucking hits his head on the fucking door jam. He had to fucking duck. This motherfucker had to duck. Everybody else barely came up to his fucking nipples, dude. This motherfucker was tall as shit. Okay, do, do you see what I'm saying? Like, it's more impressive. It's more exciting when you just have the one tall fucker. That's it. That's all I'm saying about it. Um, but yeah, I really think that's important. Make your shit mean less. Um, what am I going to do? Well, I read a poem. I read poetry sort of by memory. So there you go. So there's a poem for you. Oh, there is a couple things I'm going to start throwing out here. So Kindle Vela is a fucking thing now. And, um, I've been toying with an idea with it ever since the beta went into effect and it's basically a way to tell serialized stories, which I love, but I do not like the way that their whole thing works out. They're trying to do like a radish thing or some like um, thing where you buy tokens and then you pay with tokens and you could put crowns on things. It's very silly. I, I don't like the, the game of it. But... Um, me and Lisa over at the book Eclectic um, have been doing videos. We did a video last week um, that was basically about how to submit to different magazines and stuff like that and kind of went over some shit and we're going to do some more stuff. And one of the things we wanted to do was to do a series of us trying Vela for the first time and seeing how it works. Well, I got fucking antsy, and I just went for it. And so um, I wrote the first chapter, or the first episode. And um, I decided to kind of walk away from fiction on this. So what I did, it's called Horrywood, Confessions of a Low-Budget Horror Filmmaker. And it's basically um, all of the ridiculous bullshit I had to go through in trying to be a fucking filmmaker. And I spent 10 years basically chasing that dream and going through all sorts of ridiculous shit. 
and making a lot of movies, and um, a lot of them never even came out. I went through all this stuff, and I have over 100 chapters, 100 episodes, I guess, worth of shit to talk about. So the first one is called um, Popping My Cherry, and then the one I'm going to write today and put up. And I guess the first three are free, so I'm trying to figure this out. But the one I'm going to write today is going to be called something along the lines of um, Dick Costs More Than Film. I don't know. Something along those lines. So if you're into, if you want to know about filmmaking or script writing or anything like that, or you're into serialized shit, or you're into Vela, or you like pain with things with tokens, I don't fucking know. That's up now. Uh, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind is on my Etsy shop right now. Um... The brain, or Jesus Christ, the Zombie Zero books are up. Um, Sometime this week, Black Market Blood Drive is going to be up on Amazon as well. And sometime this week, um, or maybe next week, I'm going to have an actual poetry chapbook out again. And this one is called Last Chance. And it is a book of poems about gas stations in the middle of nowhere ordeals that happened at these gas stations in the middle of nowhere so that should be interesting so i'll probably have something about that up this in the next few days so blood rag issue four out now um all sorts of shit guys so type hard keep buying my books and um i guess i will talk to you guys later I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys, and thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.